start or frame chapter five with some of the larger issues to think about this chapter, because we can get into a, a lot of different, can go off in all kinds of different crazy little directions in this chapter. And so I wanted to kind of pull back and ask, ask what this chapter is about in the big sense. And in some ways it is trying to answer the classic anthropological question, perhaps the most classic anthropological question, is if you take two human beings from different parts of the world, or maybe even from the same part of the world, they put them in the same situation, or they might perceive things differently, or think about things differently, or maybe take different actions differently. And um, this is kind of a puzzle in the sense that, you know, we are all one big human species. Why do we seem to think and act so differently from each other? Now, in the olden days, why would they have said that humans think and act differently from each other? In the olden days, they would have looked around the room and said, Yes, Gabe. Yeah, and what makes it, what, what kind of fundamental differences would they be looking for? How, how far are we going? Are let's we just go, go, let's go a couple hundred years ago. Uh, they would think about like culture areas. No, no, they're not thinking about culture areas yet. A couple hundred years ago, let's go 300 years ago, just to put us on the safe side. Maybe 250. What's the classic explanation? Look around at each other. Exactly. You would say, hey, look at these people. They look different. That must be the reason they're acting different. The idea was it came from our biology or from our race, right? So, aha, got it. So we'll just measure the people and measure their skin, and we can figure out why they think and act differently. Along with that came an idea that I'm just going to call gross environmental determinism. Let's just say this kind of large scale, like, aha, those people can grow bananas all year round. So they don't have the same ideas about the future as those of us who live in winter climates where we have to store up things. Um, and it was kind of gross in the sense that it was, it was sort of equally racist and went with the racist stuff that was being propounded. And so anthropology comes into this situation where this is what people basically believe and they propose something else which is the idea that people are different, not because they their physical characteristics and not because of this very gross, large-scale environmental determinism, but because of something that we would call culture or learned behavior. We learn how to be uh, differently human in different places. Hopefully now, we won't bother to go through why these other explanations are incorrect. Hopefully by now in anthropology or in your life, you have figured this one out. You want a refresher, we can go back into the intro to anthropology lectures and go meticulously through this. But we'll just say that those, those things keep coming up, by the way. As we know, in our own society, they keep having to be refuted time and time again. But we'll spare ourselves that and just say, we know now that it is something about learned behavior and, and what we learn to do as members of a particular society. Now, in its most extreme form, as promoted by Franz Boas, who we'll talk about a little bit, and some of the people in, especially in the North American School of Cultural Anthropology, Boas uh, came up with something that he called or was called historical particularism, which basically meant you had to look at the historical features of each society in order to figure out what were the internal dynamics of that society. And it was kind of like culture, it was kind of like 
random in some ways. It was it was pretty much that you couldn't couldn't really make any big statements about why people were different because it just happened to be that oh, different people were different and it was all was all down to the particulars of history which were essentially who knows why you couldn't figure it out so boaz basically spent a lot of time saying that ah, people are all different and who knows why now there was always i think a a sort of in anthropology and other places, a kind of subtrend which said, well, I mean, and, and Boaz never gave up looking at the environment, said, you know, well, we should look at the physical environment, what people can do in certain places, what they are able to do with their environment. And there was uh, a pretty strong trend, which is still true today, to think about social and political and cultural organization as very much related to how people got their food and how people organized their labor. And so the idea of modes of production, which in some ways is, is related to, is associated with, with Karl Marx and Marxian economic theory, but comes to us, can come to us from other places too. It doesn't have to be just from Marx. The idea that, you know, we can have these uh, different groups of people based on how they produce things. So hunters and gatherers, herders and agriculturalists or industrial society is going to be organized differently. And that's going to have a lot to do with how their culture works. So um, in any case, and disproving the, the big theory or the big stereotypes about people, there have been these debates about you know, how much can we explain what people are doing? Graeber and Wengro, in this book and in this chapter, they want to keep these, and they don't want to discard the idea of environmental factors or economic factors or how people produce, but they are trying to tell us a couple things or a few things. One thing is that peoples in the past and today, or at least we should be able to today, were politically conscious. That is, they had some idea of what their society should or could be like, and that they made choices along the way, that they weren't simply robots or automatons determined by their environment or by their culture. And later on in the chapter, they say that in this book, they're going to try and trend towards the idea of freedom. That is to say, they're going to stress a little bit more than has sometimes been the case that people are able to navigate and make these kinds of choices. Again, not forgetting the constraints on people, but trying to figure out how much, how much freedom or how much, as we'll talk about, agency do people have. And that the differences that we see as different societies uh, configure themselves and make these choices that a lot of times the differences that we see between people are made in reference to other people. And so people differentiate themselves against others that are around them, their neighbors. Um, and they might not, if their neighbors weren't there, or I, how to say, if they, if they didn't have people to differentiate themselves against, they might not come up with these more extreme versions of, of their society. And again, in this, we've seen this introduced before in the book, but it will come out a lot in this chapter, the idea of schismogenesis, or the beginning of difference or schism or change how do how does something that might be small at first result in large differences um, among or between societies so that's the big i think ideas to kind of keep in mind in this chapter throughout uh again this is the uh, this is some of the most classic anthropological questions the most classic social science questions and we probably it's probably also no coincidence that we get introduced in this chapter or we get reminded in this chapter of some of those big big man thinkers from the past like Max Weber and Karl Marx and um Marcel Mauss 
Who else is big? Ah, I think I think those are the the big guys. Oh, plus Franz Boas, American anthropology. They begin the chapter with a little bit of a summary of the first four chapters, which is nice for us if we just need to catch up of everything that has gone on before agriculture. And in this case, things are kind of surprising in that what we see is that they've been trying to claim that there were already people living in, so they weren't just all moving around, nomadic. There were already sedentary villages and towns, some of which had been around for a very long time. We have these big monumental architecture, sanctuaries, wealth accumulation, burials, and we have people making things that become great wood carvers and architects, builders. Things that we once thought you could only do with agriculture, we already see that happening uh, in these hunting and gathering societies. They go through several examples, which we just saw, like Poverty Point in Louisiana, a crazy big, looks like might be an urban complex at a time when they were clearly not agricultural farmers. The 10,000 years of Japanese civilization before rice cultivation gives us all kinds of great architecture, Legend of Zelda video game material. So we've seen that example again before cultivation. The kingdom of Calusa on, in what is now Florida, which was a marine, you know, a, a society which, which thrived on marine resources and seemed to have a king, which was a pretty powerful place. And the Spaniards were uh, said that this was a true king who could do anything he wanted. Now, what they also say is that these examples have been in the case of Poverty Point and others, can simply ignored. As we talked about, we'd never heard of Poverty Point, even though we lived in this country, in the United States, it's not even considered, even though we supposedly studied archeology span too. We don't know about it. We certainly don't know about it on a global scale. It's not put in with the history of urbanism. Or in the case of Japan and other societies that they're kind of said, oh, well, that's, you know, those are, Coastal peoples, they're not like other hunter-gatherers, they're an anomaly, they're not, they're not, uh, they're, they're not really hunter-gatherers. In the spirit of the no true Scotsman argument, they're not true hunter-gatherers, they're an anomaly. And it's just, what were they doing carving those big wood poles? Or in the case of Calusa, the idea is that they're about to turn into something, they're about to become agricultural. That's incipient. They're on the road to being it, but it just got interrupted by the Spanish conquest. And so, again, you then write people off as, well, they're, they're developing this other system. They're about to stop being hunter-gatherers and start being something else. So they're saying that, actually, this is not the case, that these are super interesting political, social, economic forms that were very different than what we've been taught about the idea of egalitarian, wandering, hunter-gatherer bands, that in fact there was all this cool stuff going on before agriculture. So again, we were just kind of in the summarizing and recap phase. We then turn to what is the, the big or I mean the focus of the chapter, which is the indigenous peoples on the Pacific coast of North America. So an area running from what is now basically Southern California up through probably you know, almost to Alaska on the coast of the area. So the, the West Coast, the left coast as it's known today. So basically, these peoples, uh, Graber and Wengrosse, were notorious or well-known for their industry. And by industry, they don't mean they were pumping out the 
gadgets, but they were, they had an enormous work ethic and they liked to accumulate things. They had a lot of stuff around. And so when people were kind of amazed by how much stuff and work ethic that they had when they showed up, they also had uh, some very interesting techniques of land management to help uh, the things that they wanted to grow, grow, uh, including the use of fire and, and marine resources. Um, interestingly, just I thought this was just kind of fascinating here is that, is that sometimes it seems like archaeologists have used the Pacific coast of California as a way of trying to figure out what it was like in the Middle East before agriculture. So, and Greater and Wengo kind of made fun of them, but they kind of said, well, there's some reason because in some ways there's an ecological similarity there with the, with the climate zones and the way it, the, the way that the Fertile Crescent might have looked and the fact that you can grow so much great wine in California today testifies that maybe it is kind of like the Mediterranean. But um, certainly we can't use it as an example of what agriculture would have developed from because quite curiously, at least according to Graeber and Wengro, the peoples of the, of the Pacific coast were, they say that they were anti-agriculture anti-agriculture or anti-agricultural, that they explicitly rejected cultivating, especially domesticated food. Um, and the reason they say that, that they rejected it is because people were growing corn and other things nearby. In fact, of course, the, the uh, in, in in the Americas, in the area in, in what is now the Az, what was the Aztec Empire, what is now Mesoamerica, and through out even into the Northeast, people were started to grow crops. So they would have known about these. And in fact, as they said, what's interesting about this is that they did grow, they did cultivate tobacco. Everybody needs that and some plants for doing various rituals. So they knew about, they knew how to grow things. They weren't dummies. And they were also familiar with the crops, but they did not want to plant things that they would eat every day, which is a little bit curious and goes against what we usually think of as, you know, that agriculture is so great. Um, and that everybody adopts it as soon as they can in order to feed all the people. Um, now, uh, this has been explained as environmental factors that there were so many acorns and fish and pine nuts and all this stuff that was naturally abundant that there was no reason to then cultivate through this zone that they could just re rely on on wild resources. But as Graeber and Wengro put it, and you know, it seems, wasn't there any place where you could grow corn? It, you know, it's a great place to grow corn, California. Was there no place that it would have been good to grow some corn or beans or squash or pumpkins or watermelons, which are all things that not only can be grown in California the and the Northwest, but have been grown throughout the Americas, so they would have had access to these. And the question is, you know, why, why would they reject uh, this form of agriculture, knowing about the crops and knowing about the techniques? Why did they not do it? So before we go into that, though, they have to say, well, we're going to step back and say, well, why are different cultures different. Why are people different from each other uh, in the first place? And they say that actually for most of us, we just say, well, of course, different people are different and it's the same as speaking different languages. So we just say, uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of maps onto language and land and area. And they talk about the idea that, you know, from one common language, you have this 
branching out process. So you have these, uh, you know, certain common uh, Indo-European languages which split off into this language and that language after, after gradual accumulation of different traits. And so they split off into different cultural areas. Um, and, but one of the things about this is one of the reasons it seems so self-evident to us today is that we have an idea about how a nation is supposed to have one language and one culture on one piece of land. And we take that idea and we project it back into the past. And this seems to actually not be the case in the past. It seems like in the past, people were more multilingual. That is, they spoke more than one language routinely. They traveled more over long distances and their societies were not, were more porous. That is to say the boundaries between them, you could, you could venture into different societies over long distances as we've talked about. And I think this is true even to an extent today. I mean, uh, U.S. citizens are famously and fiercely very monolingual. We don't like anybody speaking more than one language. <laughs> Why are you smiling, Felicia? <laughs> is it true? You find that true? Yeah, I was going to, I was thinking. Hey, what are you saying? Yeah, people get suspicious. This is where I, those of you who have been with me in other classes know that the United States is a language graveyard. When people come here from other countries speaking one, two, or three languages, and then th their children inevitably barely speak their parents' language, and their grandchildren almost never speak a word of it. So we are fiercely multilingual. And you can just talk to my kids about, I mean, fiercely monolingual. You know, we, we eliminate languages all the time. In fact, that's part of our heritage. Felicia, do you speak more than one language? Speaking four languages. Four languages, exactly. And do you think that would be atypical of someone who... No, it's completely typical. Four languages, folks, take that. So there you go. That that would be completely, completely fine. Completely expected to speak four to seven languages. Grow up with that. Right? The notion of a language corresponding to a culture area, which corresponds to a land area, is actually particularly messed up or particularly different when it comes to places like California and especially the indigenous Americas. Uh, the anthropologist Alfred Krober and others have called the Pacific coast a shatter zone. You have all these different languages. Uh, you can't see them all, but they, they often come from pretty different language families they don't seem to be, it's not clear exactly if there was a language drift. There's not, as we see in, in some parts of Europe, a language continuum of gradual change. Often this is pretty immediate change. And you can have similar cultural traits in a region, but speaking very different languages. So it goes against a lot of our ideas about how these things are supposed to coincide. And there was also a lot of interchange and interconnection. Now, of course, <laughs> this is probably the beginning of US monolingualism. It definitely wiped out a lot of the speakers of these languages and with them, the languages too are difficult to, uh, to reconstruct, but it seems to be a, a fiercely multilingual area and you probably would have been expected to know four to seven languages. You would grow up uh, speaking the languages, both of your own and other groups routinely. So again, the idea that these would all correspond to individual, individual cultures or individual nations 
is not really what was happening in the past. We could, though, Boaz and Krober felt, group these into relatively similar culture areas. All right, Gabe, now you're on. Where did we get this idea of the culture area for, from? Something dear to your heart. Well, it's especially important when you want to do something like show people what these things are like. It actually comes out of... Yeah, and... And... <laughs> a place, a place you go to see different cultures. Museums, yay, all right. Museum studies, that's what I was... I was Hitting Gabe so hard. Yeah, it actually was a way to organize the museum, to show people, to gather this stuff together and to put it in order. And yes, exactly. It was Boaz who basically started to organize or reorganize for his first time museums in North America. Um, before Boaz, museums are museums are weird. They're, they're always weird. Um, but if you go to some museums sometimes and, and uh, you, often they were just a clutter house you just throw everything into one room in fact i think the jaeger museum was pretty much just a big box of whatever jaeger found and could put in the same place right i mean it was just all there and so people were trying to figure out all right what should we do with this one of the ideas was that you would put the museum together as the stages of humanity. So it's like, okay, these are all the things from the hunters, and these are all the things from the, the herders, and these are all the things from the farmers. So you'd put these stages of society together, and Boaz was like, no, wait a second. Like the same object, an object that looks the same might be used completely differently in a different society. So you can't just put this together according to so-called stages. And what he was trying to do also was the idea of the stages went with the idea that different races or different culture groups were, could be arranged in a hierarchy and that everybody's kind of on this road to civilization. And if we, if we lay this out in the museum, everybody will, will see the, the road of human progress. And of course, Boaz is is fighting against these ideas, one, because they're wrong, and two, because he has a particular interest, being an immigrant German Jew, in, uh, in fighting the, the anti-Semitism that was gaining ground at the time. And so uh, organizing these things, things into culture areas went well with his, uh, with his approach. And it actually was, it was just a good way to organize things because it, if you put them basically close to the region in which they were found, the culture area in which they were found, it was it organized them better than trying to group them according to language. It organ it organized better than trying to group them. Ah, here's all the stuff of people who fish, or here's all the stuff of people who 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 hunt. Um, it worked better to put them in the same kind of culture geographical area. And as Graven Wingro note. It worked for archaeology, too. Oh, there's your V. Gordon child. Yes, Gabe, you're right. Exactly. Citing people all the time. Um, it worked for archaeologists uh, in other places to do this kind of thing, to organize people into culture areas. So once that was done, though, the question became, well, how, does, how did this material or how do things get from one place to another? And so the prominent idea back in the day is in early anthropology was to try and trace, you know, well, how do these customs diffuse? And they were trying to reconstruct sort of the historical migrations, the root of peoples, the interchange. And apparently this was especially true, uh, or they especially tried to figure out uh, different games and musical instruments because these things, there shouldn't be sort of constraints on, on sharing these things. 
For example, if you were trying to diffuse the cultivation of corn, you get to a certain latitude and you're like, all right, no corn grows above this. So there's an environmental constraint. But there shouldn't be an environmental constraint on who can do a cat's cradle. Anybody play this game? As a kid, you didn't do the string game? I found all sorts of websites and we, I remember doing some things like this as a kid. And then I've totally forgotten. Actually, I probably sucked at it. And uh, then I looked and tried to figure out the cat's cradle. And apparently you can get, this is from WikiHow. Now you can get it on YouTube. There's all sorts of places. I think this picked up during the pandemic. They were like, all right, got nothing to do. We're going to figure out how to do these old string games. Um, so according to Graver and Wengro, though, this was big anthropology back in the day. There were whole articles written on different forms of playing the string games and different ways, and you'd have these. And I don't know. It sounds cool. It sounds kind of fun in its own way to do this, but it's kind of passed into the background of what people care about. Um, people really thought they could figure things out based on this. Boaz, of course, thought it was relatively random how these things spread, but other people were really trying to figure out, okay, if we can trace the cat's cradle, we can figure it out how people migrated and interchanged. Marcel Mauss said, nah, it's not going to work. This whole diffusion thing is not going to work. Apparently not. He thought it was interesting, but uh, his idea was that people in the olden days, traveled a lot more anyway. So they would have been familiar with all these different things. There wasn't, it, it wasn't like uh, that they, that these things had to, had to diffuse slowly, they could diffuse rapidly. And apparently he taught a college class called On the Greasy Pole, there it is, the greasy pole game as played in Indonesia, where apparently you grease up a pole and everybody tries to climb up it as fast as they can. And it sounds kind of yucky. On the greasy pole, the ball play, and other games on the periphery of the Pacific Ocean. So that was Moses chorus. I think I should bring that chorus back. I think I should just retitle it and teach it next year. On the greasy pole, the ball play and other games on the periphery of the Pacific coast. So he was convinced that the whole Pacific coast, and by Pacific coast, he meant from all the way from New Zealand all the way around, were had these similar types of games. There's something weird about greasy poles and ball games all the way around. I have to say, something about that course is going to attract the wrong kind of people. But... His point was <laughs> that people actually define themselves not just on basis of their internal characteristics, but how they view themselves against their neighbors. And that what happens is a process of what he called borrowing and refusal. So that uh, people would both borrow things, and we're constantly borrowing things, but also refusing things. No, actually, just going to skip real fast to the next slide because we'll be talking about that in the, in the next class. Bah! All right, let's go into California. And Walter Goldschmidt, who also wrote a, a book about uh, land rights and use, apparently was a very big advocate for land rights and use in, in, uh, among the peoples of the Pacific Coast. So they go into this anthropologist named Walter Goldschmidt, who was talking about the Uruk, who were kind of fascinating, in part because they actually had currency or money, had stuff, a lot of the things that the Europeans called money, or Indian money, was actually not currency in the same sense of European ideas, but they actually seemed to have uh, money, and they used it, which caused them to say that, you know, hey, these guys are just like Protestant foragers, Protestant hunter-gatherers, which is a weird thing to say, and it would have been weird at the time. 
probably even stranger to us now, but what he was referring to was an extremely famous book uh, or essay published in 1905 by Max Weber, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, which Weber and Wengros are, <laughs> there we go, Graeber and Wengro say is should be familiar to just about anyone who's ever taken a social science course, which is all of you. So how familiar are you with this book? Nothing? Oh, oh well, I guess they're lying. All right, so <laughs> in order to answer this question, Weber begins with the question of what actually capitalism is. And so this book has been very much misinterpreted as like, the Protestants made capitalism. It's not what he was saying. Basically, Weber starts out with the idea of, well, we tend to think that capitalism is just greedy people getting wealthy. But, you know, the issue is that in almost every society, there are some people who are greedy and people try. So those people especially get wealthy in every society. So it can't just be about accumulating stuff because people do that everywhere. And he says that there's also lots of places that had highly developed commerce and trade, Venice and all kinds of, uh, in, 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 Asia's, in Asian and Middle Eastern societies, people traded with, with abandon. But in these societies, and in almost every society, when you got money, you either just went on a big spending spree and bought yourself a castle and or bought yourself a title or just bought a whole bunch of all the good stuff in life. Or you'd have to give it all away because everybody would be coming to you and asking for money and you were supposed to give it away. Actually, this happens to people who live win the lottery today. So if you ever win the lottery... It's usually gone within a few years and you're back to poor. So the issue is with what, what Weber was saying that there's an ethic to capitalism, which is very unusual, which is you don't spend all your money or you shouldn't spend all your money. And instead, you're supposed to in, reinvest it and expand your business. And so it went well with the idea of the Puritan idea that spending was somehow sinful. And it also provided, if you joined like a Puritan sect, then you could get the support of the community to go against your neighbors who would want you to give it away and stop hoarding your money. You could find that moral support. So, I mean, it's a really interesting argument. Um, again, it's been misinterpreted and misused all over the place, but it certainly has its has its advantages. So, Felicia, what does Goldschmidt say about the Uruk in terms of this ethic? Uh, I was saying that there were there was almost as like parade like there are precious people that cherish, cherish the spirituality and because of like the sweat lodge and the abstinence from all forms of luxury. And they saw like riches to a means to an end. Yeah, they had all these weird things. They had, again, they had money, they had private property, which was actually individually owned and they exhorted the virtues of being self-disciplined and hard work, don't overeat, don't indulge, and there you couldn't inherit a title from generation to generation, pausing Goldschmidt and to say that they had very ascetic values, right? That they were, you know, working all the time. Decur, as you said, this is kind of weird these days. Don't find these values anymore. <laughs> Yeah, the Puritans have fallen on hard times. We're more like 
I think we probably like these people more on the Northwest Coast. Liz, what is striking about the Northwest Coast? What do they do? Yeah, and they especially had big feasts and celebrations known as the potlatch, which is hard to, I mean, it's, it's hard to even imagine these things today, but well, I guess. Maybe Descartes has been to these things where these huge displays of excess, you know, giving stuff away, even destroying stuff in order to prove your grandeur and you're consuming all this stuff and giving it away to the extent that Matt, you noted this, that they were compared them to mafia dons. Well, down south on the coast, yeah, he says they were like, like mafia dons, which seems a little bit strange, but it is related to this idea of, you know, you have these sort of noble families, they end up in these patronage relationships with others. I think, you know, it's a weird comparison, I think, but it makes a little bit of sense. And uh, one of my friends once, uh, an Italian anthropologist said, made it an interesting comparison. They had this big trial in Italy, apparently, where they were uh, had were trying some of the, the mafia families in Sicily. And they were trying to figure out, you know, what, what exactly they were doing in it. At one point, apparently, the judge got so confused and just said point blank to this guy. He's like, well, who are you? And this person said, we are the anti-state. And what I think he meant by that is, okay, you have your bureaucracy and you have your modernity and you have all this stuff, but what we have are the values of family, patronage, loyalty. We have all the stuff that, you know, that, that, that people need, basically. We are the anti-state. So, you know, I mean, there's maybe there's some, some truth to that. What they say is that we should definitely not lump these societies together, the, the south of the river societies that didn't have these things and the north. People have just put these in the same group. They're all like, they call them complex hunter-gatherers or affluent foragers. He says, wait a second, this can't. This, this is not, this can't be a good grouping of societies. And so again, they tackle the question of what accounts for social differences and environmental factors, economic organization, cultural values, or following most, do people organize themselves in reference to each other? And the Feast of the Potlatch is a potentially good example to start in because in both of these societies, you have these feasts, but does that mean it's the same institution, the same social institution, but two very different versions? Is it two very different things? Or in one society, are they doing potlatch, and in the other society, are they doing the opposite of potlatch or anti-potlatch? So it's a sort of big question in the thing. Oh, that was meant to be animated like that. And they say that the key might be institution of slavery, which is rather surprising. We did not expect to find slavery in indigenous societies in the Americas. We did not expect to find it, as, and the Europeans didn't either, as, at these levels of proportions, as much as 25% enslaved, and that it, it was a hereditary category. 
and that there was a division between basically the societies north of the Klamath River, runs almost along the contemporary California-Oregon border, and the societies north of that and the societies south of that, where in one, in the societies north, they had enslavement and raids, and in the south of that, they almost always did not. Anyone been here? Any West Coast people, travelers? No? A rather beautiful area of the world. Where I was looking from, from the Klamath River, it's, uh, they're actually now, they're trying to, what the Arab, what we did, what the U.S. Americans did is we went out there and put a bunch of dams in the river to generate hydroelectric power, which then uh, flooded a bunch of land, killed a lot of fish. And so they're now trying to remove the dams. And it's a big, uh, it's a big issue to, you know, try and remove the dams and try and do it right and to try and bring back uh, some of these uh, fish species and the way they used to run up the river. So this is actually kind of a contemporary issue on the Klamath about uh, the, with uh, contemporary uh, indigenous peoples as well. All right.